Okay, well, welcome everybody. I can see the numbers coming in now. Um, I will start and I want to start by saying I uh, live and work uh, in Brisbane on the lands of the Turbul and Yogara people and QUT is also uh, located there. And just to acknowledge that clearly they have always been places of teaching and learning and to acknowledge that they were lands that were never ceded and are not Aboriginal lands in the past, but are still Aboriginal lands today. So thank you for coming for this session um, on research integrity. I'm going to, we've got three uh, excellent speakers today. I'm going to introduce them all. So Sean Koo completed his PhD in behavioral neuroscience before moving to Canada for a postdoc. On returning to Australia, he took on the role of senior case manager at UNSW, where he investigates research integrity complaints and develops resources and materials to promote the responsible conduct of research. Paul Sue completed his PhD in dermatology at the University of Sydney. He's a research integrity and projects uh, coordinator at Macquarie University, where he investigates research integrity complaints and delivers research integrity education and training. And Karen Alave Encina completed her PhD in education at U University of Queensland, focusing on assessment and feedback in higher education. She is currently the education and training coordinator for research ethics and integrity at UQ, where she designs teaching experiences and online research integrity training. So what an excellent panel to talk about uh, a topic that we should all really care about. So I'll hand over to Sean. Oh, sorry, one last thing. If you're interested in research integrity and meta research in general, we're having the next AMOS conference is in Brisbane uh, in November. So please come along or join us online. I'll stop sharing now, Sean, so you can start. Thank you, Adrian. And uh, can everyone see my screen? Uh, yep, so thank you, thank you everyone uh, for coming today to our discussion group on uh, research integrity training. It's great to be here as part of the AMOS uh, sponsored virtual symposium in the lead up to Meta Science 2023. Uh, our goal here today is to gather insights on how we can design and deliver better research and training um, in our institutions. We know that there are several um, areas that researchers want better or more training on, uh, and they, they want that training to help them to keep up with practices or requirements that are always evolving and always becoming more rigorous and more stringent. However, at the same time, uh, you know, we know that researchers uh, have as researchers ourselves, uh, or people with backgrounds in research, we know that just how overloaded researchers are today. And so that's why we want to uh, talk to, to our colleagues about how we can better help uh, deliver better training and how we can improve training and uh, you know, help researchers to stay out of trouble as well. So today's session is going to be very interactive. It is more of a discussion group rather than us talking to you. I have seen uh, already from uh, the participants in this, uh, this webinar that there are lots of people who probably know a lot more than me about how to do this. So we really are looking for your comments, uh, questions and insights. So please raise your hand or pop your comment into the chat or Q&A. Um, and you know, we'll start with our overall discussion questions. And if we uh, want to, we'll get into some more specific scenarios as well. So uh, without further ado, um, you know, these are the main questions that we're interested in discussing today. So the first of them is, how can we deliver training to overloaded researchers that is more appropriate to their needs? Um, the second is, how can we engage senior researchers in research integrity training so they can support their mentees as practices and requirements evolve. The third is what training formats and approaches are most effective. And the fourth is what is missing in currently available research integrity. So before we look at specific scenarios, does anyone have any comments or questions or insights they'd like to, to raise right at the get go? Sean, I might use my prerogative as chair. Just, just to say to that first one, so the, the key word for there in me is overloaded researchers. 
So I'm wondering if, if we could take the load off researchers, they might have more time for research integrity training. And it's kind of the fact that people are, if people are too busy for research integrity training, then they're spending their time on the wrong things. I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, absolutely. I think workload is, is a constant pressure uh, for academics and researchers. Um, you know, from PhD, postdoc, all the way up to full professor, um, it doesn't ever get easier as people go through. And it's, it's, it's a really difficult question because there's always more that, that researchers seem to be being asked to do. Uh, stricter requirements, um, you know, more paperwork or admin. And I think it's really hard to try and find ways to take that load off researchers. I mean, one way um, is to better support professional staff or better to, or to have more uh, professional staff who can take on that administrative load for researchers. But, you know, that runs into significant resourcing issues. So I don't have any easy answers to that one. Yeah, and I'll um, probably um, second you there, Sean. I, th I think as an institution, we, we should provide that support to, results, or to researchers, whether through the professional staff pathway or to actually start using processes or technology to alleviate some of this admin burden, streamline processes there. Um, I, I think a lot of researchers do find that a lot of it is just red tape and, and just, you know, they're, they're forced to do it for the sake of doing it. Um, and I guess if may, perhaps re institutions can assess the risk, probably delegate some of the lower risk activities to support staff uh, and, and let researchers focus on what they do best, which is the research, um, may, maybe that can go a long way instead of it being seen as though the institution is imposing these additional burdens and mandatory training and, and, and whatnot. Yeah, and it doesn't even have to be related to research integrity either, Paul. Like I, I saw um, a presentation very recently about how adjusting an approval process meant that there was a huge reduction in the number of people who had to get approval to do a certain activity. And that just cuts out a whole lot of red tape that people are, you know, have to jump through. I mean, sometimes you do need those approvals because otherwise people spend money on things they're not supposed to. But, um, you know, if we can cut out those things, you know, there are people who work on the professional side, professional staff side, who want to get rid of as much of this red tape as possible. Um, Karen, did you have anything you wanted to add before we get into some of these questions that are popping up? Oh, I totally agree. And I don't think that the, um, the load of work that the researchers have um, is not going to be reduced. Um, um, I, 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 I don't, personally, I don't see that coming. And um, I have the feeling that we had a meeting the other day and the researchers are saying that um, there are more requirements about completing training in general from other areas also. So it's not only about research integrity, they have to juggle about different uh, requirements. So that's why um, we would like to get some ideas about what we can use uh, to make our training more engaging or, and more easy to digest for the researchers that are very busy. Thanks. Um, so I'm just going to get into the first question <clears throat> from Jason. I was wondering what the scope of integrity is. Is it avoiding fraud? Is it about open and reproducible research? or avoiding questionable research practices? Um, my first thought is both and all of the above. I mean, you have, uh, on the one hand, the negative side of research integrity, which is non-compliance, I think, which is about things like data falsification, fabrication, um, plagiarism um, at the most serious end. And then you have you know, all sorts of other things in there as well. In our office, we deal with everything from, you know, any, anything can be an authorship. Uh, and research integrity issue from authorship disputes um, to uh, mis or misrepresenting your data, uh, you know, animal ethics, human ethics. These are all integrity issues. There, are, it's a very broad field, um, and we usually, in as investigators, deal with things in the bridge. But I think it is also about uh, open and reproducible research and and making things better, improving best practice, and and improving. Uh, regular practice as well, so that it is even better than it is. So I think there are two ends of it. 
Um, and I'm interested to hear what Paul and Karen think as well. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And I think historically, there's always been a focus on that negative aspect of research integrity about the breaches and research misconduct. And I think we sort of need to shift the dial and, and, and sort of focus on the positive um, and essentially promote the idea that research integrity means research quality. It means trustworthy research. It means that we can improve society through our findings. It means reduced uh, wastage when it comes to research funds. So I, th I think if the institutions start focusing on, on this side, they're going to get a lot more bang for their buck um, in, in, in terms of return on investment there. Yeah, and uh, there have been uh, different investigations showing that um, most of the education and training associated with research integrity that focus on principles and values are more relevant, more meaningful for people um, than focusing on the negatives. Um, and I guess the problem sometimes is that because it is a broad area, um, it covers so many different things that sometimes it's hard to give like um, a general idea um, so, and, and then that's one of our questions. Uh, should we focus on one specific area or should we focus and give like an overview of everything? Thanks. Um, so our next question is, from Kathy, how can we get training into the curriculum in all empirical fields? Any thoughts? Um, I guess um, the only thing that I can think of is um, to case studies or scenarios um, to bring some situations uh, to the curriculum uh, that are associated with, with um, risks of um, people um, being involved in research integrity cases. Um, I, th I think the general principles and values of responsible research and research integrity apply to all fields. So I think maybe as, as an introduction that that can be incorporated uh, in all research at the university. It, it, it may be that, um, as Karen's indicated, certain case studies relevant to specific disciplines be, be targeted to those cohorts to make it more relevant for, for, for those um, stakeholders. I think there also is some training that's already embedded in the curricula. Um, I remember from my undergrad days learning about, you know, things like Stanford prison experiments or Milgram's um, electric shocks and things that, you know, would not be considered ethical today, but were nevertheless classic studies uh, in their field. Um, so I think it really is something that does require a lot of cooperation um, cooperation to get these things into the curriculum because you need the academics who are delivering these courses to actually include them in or invite um, you know, research integrity staff like ourselves to come along to these sessions. So it's something that uh, I think requires a lot of help from all sides. Um, so the next question is from Maura, workloads are often determined by funding patterns and some funders explicitly fund professional development. For example, I, I recently I saw this from the Wellcome Trust, but most do not. This is even more of an issue in nonprofit organizations whose revenue is based mostly on grants. Uh, I think, thanks Laura for that comment. I think that's a, a really good point that funders uh, need to put more pressure or need to provide funding and support and not just pressure. I think it also ties into um, the next comment here from Kathy, which says, I wonder if funders or researchers, or funders of research can put pressure on universities to require training. <clears throat> so I think there are two ends um, for funders here where funders are both responsible for providing requirements or stating requirements as well as supporting uh, some of these things. Um, what do you guys think? Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I, th I think um, 
in the US, they make it a requirement that at various stages um, of a, a person's fellowship that they need to do an, a minimum number of, I think it was eight or 16 hours of training. So I, th I think funders do play a key role here. Um, and I guess that sort of brings into the question of, you know, mandatory training. Um, and, and apparently some of the literature indicates that uh, if you make something mandatory, it, it's not as effective. Um, but that being said, it, it seems like there's only a handful of people that are willing to do it on their own accord. Um, so, so I think that that's, that's a, a tough one there as well. I've just got Nick raising his hand here. Nick, would you like to uh, comment? Sorry, Nick. Um, Nick? I don't think we can quite hear you. Nick, did you want to? I, I can't hear Nick. Can anyone else hear? No, I might have to move on and, and see if Nick can try again in a minute. All right. So, our next uh, question is In terms of incentives, has anyone had success promoting the idea that engaging with research integrity practices, for example, having data management plans, will facilitate the research and publication process down the road. Um, I try. Uh, I've been up in Q&As uh, talking about how having open data uh, has helped me as a researcher and opened up collaborations for me and helped me to publish um, my research more easily and, and publish more papers. Um, I don't know how successful it is, though. Does anyone else have any experience with, with uh, whether that works? Well, at, Mac at Macquarie, we're sort of at the, the very early stages of, of, of that process. So 18 months ago, we, we rolled out a very comprehensive um, research data management framework at the university where we, we've essentially made um, high degree research students complete a data management plan as part of um, their confirmation of candidature. Um, so, so we're still at the very early stages of that. Um, and, and so, yeah, ho hopefully when it comes time for them to publish in, in, in the coming years, we, we do see an increase, but we're, we're, we're sort of monitoring that space at the moment. Do you know if those data management plans are good quality data management plans, Paul? Because, I mean... Yeah, so, so what, what the university has done is we've invested quite a lot in terms of resources when it comes to helping researchers in data management plans. So we, we have a research data management plan team. Um, and, and basically when researchers submit their DMPs, it gets vetted by a data steward so that they ensure that it does meet a certain um, requirement and standard. That's a, I think that's a, another one about how professional staff you know, supporting students to, to do this can really contribute a lot because, um, you know, I think sometimes we've seen that, or I've seen that if you just leave researchers on their own to do it and no one's ever taught them how to do a data management plan or what needs to be in there, you end up with data management plans that are like, oh, I'm going to put it on a USB or I will keep it on my laptop and then, or they never, or they write something and never follow it. Uh, exactly. So Exactly. And, and when it comes to hard, the hard sections where, you know, you actually have to do put in a bit of work, like when it comes to the, the metadata and the different formats, then, you know, it sort of gets in the too hard basket and gets left empty. So having a data steward provide that guidance has really been helpful in, in our scenario. Any other questions or comments on that one? Yeah, we're very similar. We use some um, um, examples of uh, how things can go wrong with the data and the importance of a data management plan and the benefits that um, we're not really sure how effective those examples and ideas are. And if, um, if based on those um, people attending those trainings and hearing those um, examples, um, 
they are actually incorporating those ideas in their practices. Yeah, that that's always like a question mark for us. The next question is, um, from my experience in teaching research integrity, I don't see much focus on publication integrity and teaching students and ECRs about how to recognise trustworthy papers in their disciplines. Could the panel comment on whether they are aware of this kind of training? I, I think that there is some of it embedded in uh, in labs and training of, of, of students and ECRs and specific research groups. And I think some of, a lot of it is uh, self-motivated um, as well. I, me I remember when I was just starting as a researcher, we had a lecture uh, from a very eminent scientist who came and listed a whole bunch of papers that he thought you should throw in the bin and explain why. Uh, so I thought that was a really useful lecture. Um, I don't know how widespread that kind of approach is. Um, does anyone else have any comments on it? Yeah, no, I, I agree with Jennifer. I don't, I don't think we really focus on the publication integrity um, aspects and recognising trustworthy, other than the fact that you know, we, we try to teach our, our students and our, our researchers about using their critical thinking skills. But I, th I think um, what's been really helpful as of late are things like Retraction Watch and PubPeer and, and the, um, the blogs that identify issues with published papers. And, and, and that in one sense sort of highlights, um, you know, some, some of the issues that um, exist in the literature. But yeah, no, when it comes to specifically providing training on, on this aspect, I, I, I think that's an area we can definitely improve on. Um, in our case, uh, we do not focus on recognizing trustworthy papers um, because uh, we know that that belongs to academic integrity and there we do have training about academic integrity that focus on that and they provide information associated with that. Um, so it's 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 another area that focuses on particular. I think that's a good point, Karen, as well, because you know one thing that might set apart a trustworthy paper in one field uh, would be completely irrelevant in another. I mean, in my field, uh, where I did my PhD, the number of animals would have no bearing, uh, for example, in a in a qualitative research study, perhaps. Uh, so it's. It is really discipline dependent and does require, I think, a lot um, from the academics. And so I remember it was the academics who were teaching courses who would, when I was um, an undergrad and, and PhD student, who delivered that kind of training because that was their interest. Um, so it wasn't systemic or, or structural, uh, which is, a, I think, a weakness in trying to deliver it, is that it relies on the academics who are interested in doing it. So how we get that is a lot more difficult. Um, the next one is how can we avoid cherry picking the data um, when the researchers get to choose which experimental data goes to publication and which not? That's a hard one. Yeah, I, I, again, the only comment that I have about that is um, we just uh, providing a scenarios where this situation is um, reflected and we make, I mean, the research integrity officers make comments about that and that that, that is not right, um, that you should not do that and those sort of things. Um, but how to avoid it, um, yeah, I don't have a response. I think it's a hard one because, you know, if you... Unless you're doing completely open notebook science, you know, you you have to choose which experiments or which data goes into a paper. And sometimes data is just not worth putting in a paper. Like you know, if your whole protocol didn't work, there's no reason for you to publish it. But on the other hand, I can definitely understand. Uh, I think it's 
It has to be a culture thing. Sure. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I, I, th I think it's, it's just to embed those, those principles and values of why we're doing the research in the first place um, and, and not to, you know, have data that matches your hypothesis um, or, or, or choose data that only matches your hypothesis. Um, and and I, I think may, maybe actually with, with the, the rise in AI and, and, and whatnot, um, you know, probably highlight the fact that your your data can be um, investigated again in the future uh, and and so if if it isn't legit then then it could possibly go down the investigation pathway as well so I, I think it yeah having both the the positive approach as well as instilling a little bit of fear in that there, there might be scrutiny and criticism down the track may may assist in, in the process I've got a hand up here from Kathy. Um, Kathy, would you like to say something? Yeah, I think Adrian was saying that they need to be promoted to host to speak. Is that yeah, right? I think, I think I am, but um, nothing seems to have. Can you hear me? Yes. yes I okay. Can <laughs> Sorry, I can't turn on my video. I'm not sure why, but um, this is fantastic. I, I just wanted to react to the discussion about uh, cherry picking data. And I'm wondering what the role is for training our students how to pre-register studies so that they have kind of on record what they are what they plan to look at uh, ahead of time, ahead of collecting data. Um, another approach is, is replications. So getting setting a norm in the field of replicating research. So if the, if the data are cherry picked and a replicator tries to replicate but can't replicate, it's one indication that the data were cherry picked. Just a couple thoughts. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. I think pre registration is a really good point. Um, and I know that um, the Center for Open Science and OSF have a really helpful platform for pre registration, and that there are lots of other options out there for people to do pre registration. Um, I've never received training in pre-registration. I've done it once um, and I just kind of did it because I thought it would be useful and interesting. Does anyone else have any other experiences on that or know of any training around it? My, my understanding was that it's more common in, in the clinical sciences um, to have your studies registered beforehand. But based on yesterday's talk on research ways, I, th I think it's slowly um, expanding to the other disciplines. Um, that being said, apparently there's, there's also issues about um, gaming the system there as well. So you, you could essentially get some pilot data and, and then put, put in what you intend to do afterwards. So I, I don't think it's necessarily a silver bullet there either, but you know it, 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 it's something that could also help. Yeah, I, I think so. I think there are also um, times where it's not always applicable. Uh, I've had discussions with researchers and colleagues who have said, you know, pre-registration is interesting, but my work is really exploratory, so I don't really feel like it's appropriate for me when I'm just, you know, probing different questions at different times without any serious plan. Like if you were trying to do something that's more confirmatory, like if you're running a clinical trial, you have to sort of pre-register that, um, then it's more appropriate. So it also depends on discipline uh, as well. I, I guess the other comment about cherry picking is that sometimes it also helps to have more eyes on the ground so that, you know, people are accountable to, to I, I guess it's, it relates to their data being more open. So if you're in the lab, if there's only a single person that's collecting the data, uh, then there's that, it, then it's, I guess that there's more of an easy pathway to go down the, the more deviant side of things. Whereas if you've got multiple people in the lab, then then there's more transparency there as well. And, and that sort of keeps people to account. I think that's a good point. It's easy to cheat if, if you're just on your own and you think no one's looking. But if someone's looking, it's a lot harder. Yeah. I've heard of labs where before a paper is sent to publication, the, you know, people have to present it in front of the whole lab. Um, and so I'm just going to let Angelina 
talk. I've just seen your hand up there. Would you like to say something, Angelina? Sorry, I just have to do a bit of work in the background to promote them to her co-host. Sorry. No worries. Uh, hey, can, I, can you hear me? Yes, great. Uh, I just wanted to comment on this uh, latest point about like uh, having multiple people contributing the data as a potential way to avoid, you know, fraud and cherry picking. Um, well, uh, actually, uh, the thing, the point is that um, you have to present your data to your supervisor, normally the principal investigator. And then the principal investigator decides which data goes to the publication and which not. And so we have this single point of failure, uh, like this actor who, if it's not, uh, they are not playing, you know, responsibly and correctly, eventually can, uh, uh, well, do the cherry picking. So uh, I just wanted to, to say that it doesn't really help because we have this, uh, like this single point of failure and uh, whether uh, somebody can think of other ways to to do that to improve the transparency and so on. Yeah, fair, fair point there, Angelina. I think yeah, there, there's still going to be that that weak point in the the PI or the CI determining what would go into the paper. I, I think maybe the comment more related to in the initial data collection stage where you know a student might be collecting the data and there's that temptation to, you know, massage the data to, to fit their hypothesis. Um, I, I guess another point would be that when it comes to the actual publication stage, at least uh, in the Australian context, each um, author on the paper does have a degree of responsibility um, on what's presented. So although the conversation might get awkward, um, there, there is the ability for researchers to express concerns about not putting in certain data or including other types of data. Um, so, so, so there are safeguards in, in that respect, um, but yeah, definitely open to, to any other ideas where we could um, potentially address this issue. I think that's a really difficult question. And yeah, I think the supervisor is a single point of failure um, is a valid concern. But as Paul said in the Australian framework, we do hold all authors accountable. I know at UNSW, um, you know, every single UNSW author is responsible for the whole paper. So we do hold everyone accountable. I'm just going to move to the next question because we do have quite a few in the queue. Um, Jason asks, from your perspective, do we need more meta research on research integrity? For instance, evidence on the effectiveness of training programs or research on the drivers of research integrity, research on the benefits of research integrity, for example, more earned public trust in science. Where, in your view, are there the most serious gaps in the meta research, if any? Um, would any of my colleagues like to take this one for starters? Yeah, I, I definitely agree that we, we need to do more research on research integrity. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're speaking to an audience of researchers and, and, you know, everything's based on data. So if we can actually use data to inform our decisions going forward when it comes to education and training, I, I think we're sort of speaking the same language there. Um, I know that at least at Macquarie, when it comes to the research data management training that we, we provide, we, we do ask the participants to complete a pre and a post survey. Um, you know, test, uh, asking them what they know or don't know, and, and then seeing uh, what impact the training has had um, after the completion of the, of, of the training. Um, so I, I guess from, from that end, that also allows us to tailor our future training to, to improve um, what is delivered to, to the participants. I agree, I agree. I think we always need more research and always need more data. Um, I've thought about this a bit and I think one of the key issues in implementation is um, incentives. But in order to get the people who set the incentives to act, I think they might need more data. So it's always good to have more data to show that you know, researchers that use particular practice are more reliable. 
well, for example, or have greater impact, or you know, do the kinds of things that you want uh, in order for people to start thinking, yes, we should implement these, because the decision makers are the people who care, who are worried about things like funding or impact and, and things like that, and so they might want to see more evidence, I think. Yeah, I really like the idea of a meta research to research integrity. Um, I guess one of the complexities um, in our place is that we have um, people attending from different disciplines. Um, so we need to be broad and try to um, make it engaging for everyone uh, and relevant for everyone. Um, and what is more difficult is the in measuring the impact, as Sean said. Um, we, we really don't know how to measure it, whatever they are acquiring in the training, they are applying it in their practices or not. I think that's a really great point about you know, uh, whether you can see whether the training is working or not. And I think maybe some of those things don't necessarily end up published because maybe they're just internal. Like if you're running a training program, um, you, you evaluate its effectiveness, but maybe that doesn't get published. Is that... Um, the kind of data you'd be looking at, Karen? Um, it, it's more about the behaviors of researchers um, in, in relation to research integrity when, for, for instance, they are going to publish a paper. And in the training, they said that uh, it's, it's good to have a record of the conversations between researchers and, uh, and everyone is on the same page and everyone knows uh, who is responsible for what. But... Um, our question is, uh, are they actually doing that? Um, we, we, we have told them to do so. We have told them that that's a good practice. But um, we wonder how much of that message is translating into their real uh, practices of their research. And that's really, really hard to measure. Um, and that's how we should um, perhaps measure the impact of the training in terms of how much, and, and that could be just following up on their practices in the future after attending the training. Yeah, I agree. That is a really difficult thing to figure out. And, and I mean, you can do it. It just takes a lot of time and effort, <laughs> which, you know, we don't always necessarily have enough time to do those things. Uh, so the next question is from Nick. It seems likely uh, that training might be seen to be more acceptable if people recognized how much bias or QRP, QRPs arise from unconscious versus conscious bias. Are there data out there on the relative importance of conscious versus unconscious bias? I don't know the answer to this question. Um, does anyone else? Anyone from the audience have uh, any expertise in conscious versus unconscious bias in, in QRPs or anything like that? Uh, sorry, Nick. I'm sorry we don't seem to be able to answer that for you. Uh, the next question is from Kathy. Should we be doing more, more training on how to detect errors, detect questionable research practices, etc.? We've seen some of this, but I'm guessing there is much more to do. I think that's related to an earlier question that we had about uh, looking at trustworthy papers. And so I, I suspect that the answer here is similar. Uh, any thoughts on that one? Yes, I, I know that, that there are certain vendors these days that are, are developing trust markers and, and looking at what's published out there. I, th I think that's more looking at positive aspects of, of, um, of papers, but not necessarily um, questionable research practices. Um, the, uh, there are programs out there that you know, are able to detect uh, image manipulation uh, or, or statistics that could be used to see if you know, data has been manufactured or, or, or sorry, um, fabricated um, just based on, on, on the statistics there, but I'm, I'm not aware of, of anything that we can sort of put in practice on a on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and, and I, guess, I guess the other question is whether or not um, there's real 
real value in in focusing on that aspect as opposed to you know trying to promote the positive side and and, and trying to instill that cultural change but I, I don't know I'll open up to my colleagues on, on what their thoughts on this are I might just uh, open it up to Jason as well from the floor. Um, Jason, would you like to address this one? Oh, hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, this was about the conscious unconscious one. Sorry, it's a bit late. No, it's that's okay. okay. Um, well, and we do know from surveys of researchers that about 50% will self-report that they do use questionable research practices. So it seems like it might not be conscious in the sense that they don't realize that it's problematic to do that just because they haven't had the appropriate training. So maybe that kind of gets at Nick's question. Thanks. And I think that's something, that's a good point. And something that I see as well in doing research integrity uh, complaints is that you know, most of the time when there is a breach of the research code, it's more on the minor end and it's more due to education and training rather than deliberate intentional misconduct. Um, so, you know, maybe that also feeds into that idea that it is not always intentional. Or, so it's mostly either unconscious or due to lack of training. Um, any other comments on that one? Yeah, I guess in my conversations with the research integrity officers, um, we, we have discussed about um, many of the problems is, are associated with um, awareness. So uh, we, we focus a lot on that, on the training and building awareness about uh, what can be wrong. Um, yeah. Yeah, the same. So the uh, majority of our cases we see relates to our uh, researchers not being aware um, they just, I guess, weren't given that appropriate training to begin with. So a lot of it is unintentional. I mean, that's one of the reasons we're here today as well, because if we can help improve training, then we can uh, prevent these issues from arising and we can reduce our own workloads. So there's a lot of self-interest in this from, from my part, at least. Um, it's funny that you make that comment, Sean, because what we've actually noticed is that Sometimes when we do provide more training, then we actually get more more queries and more complaints. So I, I think sometimes we, 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 we get in this false loop of thinking that, you know, the more training we provide, the less cases we're going to get. But um, in, in my experience, at least, what we found to be is sort of to be, to be the opposite, at least at the beginning stages. Yeah, and hopefully once, you know, you get over that initial growth and awareness that, you know, people will, understand and then after that it will plateau and uh, come down to a lower level so long term long term that's i'm the still hope, hoping. Yeah. <laughs> that's the hope um so in terms of doing training on how to detect errors and questionable research practices like i said before i think that this is one that I, is a lot like how to detect errors um i think it's something that needs to be kind of or trustworthy papers it's something that needs to be integrated into uh, the training of of young researchers, PhDs, early career researchers, and even um, supervisors as well, because you know the tools are constantly evolving. Um, you know, a few years ago, image or image duplication software wasn't even a thing, and now we have multiple options. Uh, often in the startup phase, but multiple options for trying to detect uh, image manipulation or duplication. So. You know, I think there are constantly new tools and it's, I think we, ideally we would be able to, but it's, it's hard. Um, I might go to the next question then uh, from Danny. How much do you coordinate with the training that is happening in your library? Understanding where to publish and how to make that assessment is a basic thing libraries train. Um, I'm going to confess that we, don't coordinate a terrible amount on where to publish and how to make that assessment. Uh, for me, research integrity or within within our office and, and my remit, where to publish hasn't been an issue or been part of what we deal with. However, we do coordinate with the library when um, we're talking about topics like plagiarism, copyright, uh, publication ethics, all those kinds of things. So 
we definitely do coordinate with the library and we link back and forth between each other's materials. So speaking for myself, I am a big fan of our library and uh, everything that they do and the expertise that they have. Um, so over to Paul and Karen for their comments on this one. Yeah, similarly, when it comes to the publishing aspects, we haven't really been coordinating too much on the publication side of things. We we do liaise with the library a lot when it comes when when it comes to I guess the governance framework and and policies and whatnot. Um, at Macquarie, at least, the focus is is more on research data, and, and so we we do coordinate with the library when it comes to the use of repositories and and um, information related to. Um, active storage of data and um, long-term storage. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, yeah. Yeah, same. Um, the library uh, delivers several trainings. We do not coordinate any of those trainings. They do that. They coordinate those trainings. They deliver those, those trainings. And they're mainly associated with publication, peer review, those sort of things. Um, we have seen the content that uh, they provide uh, so that we don't repeat the same information. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a different area. Our next question is from Rose. I think one of the key difficulties here is not communicating the importance of these efforts like data management plans, but rather providing sufficient training in how to competently accomplish those themes. I think generally speaking, researchers want to do high quality work and they want to act with integrity. Things fall apart when it comes, when it comes to knowing how to execute. Are there any shifts or broad trends that you are seeing in the world of research integrity training to move away from the why and into the how? I think that's a really good point. And I think it's one that um, I haven't seen a lot of training in how to do things unless for example, you know, editors are helping people do open data or something like that. That's not really within the university context. Um, I would like to do more on how, uh, but it's it's also quite difficult because there are so many different tools and options out there. So I'm going to pass over to my co um, co host to talk about this one. Yeah. So no, I completely agree with Rose. So. Um... Actually, in the State of Open Data survey last year, I think it was up to 72% of researchers um, wanted assistance with the how. Um, and and Macquarie, one, one of the things that we, we have focused on is providing that assistance through the data stewards um, in, in the submission of the data management plans and selection of an appropriate repository, um, help with um, the metadata, so I, I definitely think that um, providing that support is going to go a long way when it comes to um, promoting research integrity. I guess it's, it's difficult on the how to provide all the information that they might need. As Sean said, the characteristics of each um, research is different. The research methods are different. Uh, the collaborations are different. So. We, we usually have two hours training and it's really hard to cover all that is relevant for each person. So that's why we end up giving general information. And that would be one, one question. Sh shall we just provide a general overview or shall we focus in just one particular topic in one training? Let's say authorship, just one, one training about that rather than providing an overview of all the different things. Thanks. I'm going to move to the next question now um, on avoiding cherry picking from Laura. So on avoiding cherry picking, that's the role of pre-publication plans, but pre-publication -pre plans are a high effort solution. I think that's a good comment. Um, thanks, Laura. Another one from Anonymous. The relevant question also is who is delivering the training? That is a question of trust. Most experienced researchers know that the values officially preached by the institutions do not align with their actual actions, ignoring or hiding cases of unethical conduct to avoid damage to their reputation, putting profits or income before doing robust and transparent science. 
Thus, training delivered by such institutions, for example, universities, will be seen by default as ticking the boxes exercises rather than meaningful activity. Training provided by organizations that don't have vested interests could be more engaging and consequential. Um, so I'd like to say that at UNSW at least, we do not um, <laughs> just hide or cover up misconduct. Uh, as someone who works in the area, we do a lot of work investigating these claims. So um, I would say that that's not always true, at least in at my institution. Um, but yes, I do believe that who delivers the training is important. This is why um, I really enjoy, I hope that, you know, as someone with a PhD or research background, um, as well as a research integrity uh, role that my contributions, small as they are, do, do help. Um, but I'd like to, to know more about what others think on this. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I, I think the majority of us that get into this field of research integrity do it because we truly believe um, in good science. Um, and, and same goes with the uh, research integrity advisors and champions that we select. We choose people that actually are passionate about research and about um, sound science. Um, and and I, I, I guess when it comes to choosing uh, who does the training, um, that, that sort of um, raises additional points about who's the most appropriate person to provide training. So at our institution, we've sort of focused on the um, HDR students and the early career researchers because we, we feel that they're more amenable to training and, and also we, we have the advantage of making it compulsory at times. Um, I guess this sort of relates to question two that we've got up on the screen right now about how how we engage the more senior researchers that are sort of ingrained in their in their practices and 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 some of them believe that you know they 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 know what's best um, and and the approach that we we've tried there is to take a, a peer reviewed learning approach um, perhaps using situations that aren't so clear cut um, and so that provide more. Um, engagement there. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know if I've answered the question there, but um, that, that, that's the approach that we've taken at Macquarie. Yeah, in our case, in terms of who is delivering the training, um, it's um, the research integrity officers are the ones who are delivering the training. Um, but in my role as an education training coordinator, I provide insights from an educational point of view, how to make it more engaging and relevant. Um, and we also get feedback from attendees um, to get an idea of their perceptions. Um, yeah, if it's, if it's about ticking the boxes, um, I, we don't see that. Um, I mean, from my point of view, I don't, I don't see that in my area. Um, yeah. Thanks. I'm going to move to the next question now. Um, are there actual trade-offs between integrity and advancing one's career on traditional metrics, or is that a false narrative? Who wants to take this one for starters? I think Jason, you you do make a good point there, and and from what I've observed, sometimes there there are perks to people cutting corners. I guess in terms of at the end of the day, it comes back to researchers being overloaded, uh, and the amount of time that you can spend devoted to your research. And, and so, if if that time is spent, you know, doing the training and making sure all your your T's are crossed and your eyes are dotted, then, and, you know, as I said, with the, with the admin side of things, then that means that that's less time devoted to the research itself. Um, so I, I think in terms of traditional metrics, um, yeah, it, it, it is that fine line of still conducting responsible research, but also meeting all your requirements. And, and sometimes we do see that those that um, do cut corners do get an advantage 
in in that sense. And, and so maybe that that raises the question of whether or not um, the system needs to be looked at and and and, and rejigged, and, and that there are rewards and incentives associated with those that do the right thing. But that that's just my own personal view on that. I'm just wondering, well, how, how would you reward that? Yeah, so I don't know, maybe when it comes to the promotion um, of one's career and, 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 and to the next level, there, there are categories related to mentoring and, and you know, things that relate to, um, you know, research integrity trust markers like open science and, um, you know, data management plans or... Um, providing um, all the information when it comes to your publication. So I don't know, it's just, <laughs> they're just ideas at the moment. Yeah. I think it's a risky tactic. I know that there are lots of perverse incentives, but if you're trying to advance your career on traditional mem uh, metrics through gift authorship or fabricating data because you can't be bothered actually running experiments, um, like it's a risky way of doing things because yes, you might get, you know, a national research chair, but you might also end up written about in Nature and Retraction Watch. So, uh, you know, I would like to say that, you know, our incentives are good enough, but I would just say the only thing I think I can say with any certainty is that this that, that trying to boost your metrics through you know, not doing everything with integrity is a very risky approach. Um, so the next question is from Laura, and I know that we are reaching an hour now, so we're going to just keep going for a maximum of half an hour. Uh, so Laura asks, pre-registration is expanding in economics. The American Economic Association has a pre-registration site. Berkeley Institute for Transparency and the Social Sciences has a course in research transparency and reproducibility that includes pre-registration. I think that sounds great, you know, and, and if people who are providing the pre-registration tools are also providing the training, then that makes the most sense in terms of um, teaching people how to use it. And because it's an association, uh, you know, a society that's doing this, it sounds to me like it has the potential to be very influential. Um, what, what do you think? Yeah, no, I, I agree. I'm, all for it, um, and, and glad to see that it's actually expanding into other disciplines um, other than the clinical sciences. So on to Nick. Um, one way to get one way to getting procedures like pre-registration into the regular training stream might be for departments to mandate a discussion of the appropriateness of pre-registration in graduate advisory committee meetings early on in MSc and PhD programs. Are there departments out there that have such mandates? Not, not that I know of. Um, you know, the, there are lots of things that supervisors are already mandated to do with their students. Um, so I don't know if pre-registration is, you know, going, is, is likely to end up as one of them. Do you have any other experience with that, Paul? No, so we haven't uh, explored the pre-registration side of things. Um, we, yeah, our, our focus at the moment has more been the research data and, and we've sort of gone down that approach with the, um, the masters and the PhD programs where um, there, are, there are check boxes at the different yearly milestones um, that ask the candidates about, you know, where their data management plans are and where their data is going to be deposited, et cetera. But yeah, no, definitely something that we could look into. Darren, have you heard of any anything like this? No, we don't have that here. No. Okay, so the next one is a comment from Laura. Uh, one thing we can do as research integrity functions is highlight good practices, for example, to do so in a celebration event. I think that's a really good idea and uh, one that I would ideally also pair with a bit of money. Um, for example, I know that AAAS, the Australian Academy of Science, I think, they recently uh, launched a research integrity prize. So uh, that would have $10,000 associated with it. So I think, um, you know, I think if institutions do these kinds of things as well, I believe that there was another 
possibly in Tasmania that was doing research integrity prizes. Those kinds of things can be really good and really good incentives as well. It will help to promote the right type of researcher, one who's doing these things. Any other thoughts on that? Yeah, we're, we're hoping to launch a Research Integrity Award uh, this year as well, um, together with, you know, a Research Integrity Week um, awareness campaign. So, again, trying to focus on, on, the, on the positive side of things. Well, we, don't, we don't have anything like that here. We, 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 had a, we made a proposal of, um, and, and it's still on the stage of a proposal, of having um, um, research integrity champions. Yeah, but we, we're still in the early stages of that. I'm just going to skip over quickly the next two comments um, because they were made 20 minutes ago and seem to be related to the discussion then, just agreeing with what Paul was saying and uh, clarifying uh, another comment. So, um, the next question is from Anonymous. Is there a research from just what the existing research integrity training across different institutions are? As a student, I can say research integrity training can vary from mandatory online modules of um, MCQ questions to actual discussion workshops. Sometimes they are outdated as they do not consider the more recent developments in error detection. Does RI training vary depending on institutions? For example, um, or i.e. academia versus industry versus government. Any thoughts on this, Karen? I'm not really sure if there is a difference. Um, currently at UQ, um, we deliver training um, for all the university, but also sometimes if the faculty requires the training, we go to the faculty and deliver that training. And in that case, uh, we make some changes to the material um, to make it relevant for that faculty. Um, but yeah, in terms of government or industry, I'm, I'm not with, with there are differences in terms of the training that they deliver. Oh. Yeah, no, so I, I guess I, I'm aware that across Australia, at least, a lot, a lot of um, in, uh, universities and research institutions do end up using what's off the shelf, um, online training modules. Um, the approach that we've taken at Macquarie at this stage is to sort of develop our own in-house. Um, and, and so one of the advantages there is that it allows us to tailor the, the content and material to the different cohorts, whether it's the early career researchers or HDR students or, or more senior researchers. Um, I, I guess one of the disadvantages there is that it, it does take a lot of time to actually come up with the material. Um, and, and what we've tried to do at least is we've tried to take a blended approach where um, the, the people need to do the online training, but then we also follow that up with an online, uh, an in-person um, workshop uh, where there's more engagement and, and dialogue and, and it's a bit more interactive and, and, and that, that workshop hopefully addresses any um, gaps that the um, the online module provides. Yeah, I agree. I think that we do end up a lot using these off-the-shelf products. So that kind of creates some uniformity across institutions, but also variation between you know using product one versus product two. I'm going to move to the next question, which is from Danny, which clarifies and links in with uh, something that they were asking earlier, which is. Um, on whether we cover where to publish. And the question or the comment is, uh, where to publish addresses issues like predatory journals and suggestions of why a paper might be a poor one. And isn't it all tied together with integrity and openness and reproducibility? Um, I would, I don't uh, really know exactly how to answer this question for starters because you know, predatory journals are, I think, an integrity issue, but it's it's difficult to identify, you know, exactly what someone has done wrong if they've published a predatory journal. It really depends on the specific facts of the matter. So I think that's why the library is probably best place to do to do the education on that one. Um, Paul, did you have anything on this? Yeah, so so in, in I guess in, in the workshops that we provide, we do, we do highlight the issue of predatory journals 
Um, and, and, and basically, I, I think what we try to focus on there is how it impacts on, on the research. If they end up publishing in one of these journals, the fact that there is no um, peer review, that there are associated higher costs associated with publishing in, in, in these journals and, and um, that they're contributing to a, a bigger problem. But I think the key message we also drive um, through there is that it's going to impact on your reputation. Uh, you've published in one of these journals, um, people can see that, you know, it's essentially rubbish. And, and then that's going to be on, on your CV and, and impact on your own reputation. And I, th I think the fear associated with that is enough for people to really stop and think about it. Uh, we obviously direct them to resources like the library, to the various um, like white and blacklists, um, cables and bills. Obviously, that's not, you know, it doesn't solve the issue. But um, we really reiterate that researchers need to do their due diligence and 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 be, before they um, publish in one of these um, journals. I think that's a good point. I'm just going to take us on to um, our last question here from Nick. Many open science practices and exposure to sources of chronic research deficiencies seem to be generational. It's just a lot more difficult to do good science today than it seemed to be 20 to 40 years ago. Are there departments out there where open science advocates have successfully incorporated open science standards into defining what is expected practice for modern scientists trained in their departments? Shouldn't this kind of thing be prominent in advertising to prospective graduate students? I would possibly say that I think science today is better and more open than it was 20 to 40 years ago. So I think the standard has actually risen. Uh, when I've read papers from the 1960s and 70s, you know, and seeing graphs drawn with two rats um, and no error bars or even. And nowadays we're showing, you know, the raw data, every single dot point um, is on the figure. There's, you know, larger numbers. Um, you have defined error bars, more sophisticated statistical analyses, potentially even open data sets. I think good science stays, I think science stays better than it was 20 to 40 years ago. I'd like to give us credit for that. Uh, that researchers have stepped up and constantly evolved and constantly improved. Not to say that science 20 to 40 years ago was bad, but that certainly things have become more rigorous uh, in that time. I, I, I completely agree. I, I think sort of maybe where we are with research integrity is where research ethics was about 20 to 40 years ago. So at least in Australia, when it comes to the various legislation and guidelines and all that, I think it was in, in the 80s and 90s where we really had that first established and it, it does take that generational change to sort of embed it in the culture and make it um, standard practice. So yeah, I, I agree with Sean there that, that you know, it, it is going to take time, but you know, we are making slow incremental progress there. Karen, did you have anything to add? No, not really. Yeah, I'm not really sure about this one. Thanks. Um, so I think that brings us to the end, unless anyone has any final comments or questions, we're, you know, uh, more than an hour over time, uh, more, well, more over an hour. So we've had a very uh, lively and interesting discussion. So thank you very, very much for making the time to come to this session and, and for your comments and questions.